Hi everyone and welcome back to the Cool Story Brew podcast. This conversation you're about to hear will be mind-blowing. I was completely blown away during this conversation. The things that Michael Tallinger told me was unbelievable. This is a very well-respected person in the field. He's done tons of research into advanced ancient civilizations, specifically in South Africa. You are going to hear things about South Africa which you never heard before, which we aren't taught in schools. It's, it's mind-blowing. So enjoy the conversation and let me know your thoughts down below. Thank you very much for joining us, Michael. It's, a, it's an absolute privilege to have you on. Um, I've done a lot of research into your work, which I found very interesting. Um, and I know quite a bit about you already, but for our audience, I, I think it would be great if they could hear directly from you, uh, just a brief overview maybe of your your highlight um, projects you've worked on throughout your life and your and your accolades. Yeah, it's always, uh, first of all, hello, Austin. Great to meet you, nice to talk to you. And um, thanks for showing an interest in, in uh, the work that I've done and, and continue doing. Uh, it's always difficult to sing your own accolades or to, you know, to sing your own praises. So I'll just really be very brief. Um, I am a graduate of Wits Medical School with a degree in pharmaceutics, uh, School of Pharmacy. And, um, and, but I was involved in the arts, music, film, television stage for many years. I've worked in various industries, uh, not to mention the ones that I've already mentioned, but also pharmaceutical industry, advertising, and um, the record industry. And uh, and then um, my research that I was doing um, took me into very alternative, uh, what many people would in those days um, refer to as alternative um, research or alternative literature, and that's dealing with the ancient civilizations and the mystery of our the origins of humankind and so forth. And and that led to me writing a book called Slave Species of God after some startling discoveries that I made that are not taught at school or at university and of at in 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 those days in the early two uh, thousands or, or late nineteen uh, nineteen nineties. Uh, very few people were aware of this, and it's just started to the wave of that kind of information regarding the Sumerian texts and and uh, the the advanced Vanish civilizations were starting to to reach the the populace of the world through especially through work like Graham Hancock's Fingerprints of the Gods. Um, little did I know in those days that I would end up doing many conferences and lectures with Graham around the world in the years to come. But um, what what then that led to writing the book called Slave Species of God, God with a small g, where I was very um, specific in um, in distinguishing the difference between God with a big G and the gods with a small g. And that confused a lot of people because when they saw my cover and God was spelled with a small g, they, you know, many Christians went into horror. And uh, I had to pacify them and say, listen, this is a good thing because I'm showing a very clear distinction between the God that you believe in, the God with a big G, the God of the universe and that created everything and, um, and is responsible for everything uh, from which everything comes. And th there's, there's absolutely no connection between that source of creation and these malicious beings, uh, the gods with a small G. Uh, and that book did very well for me. It was translated into several languages, German, Italian, Japanese, Chinese, and I think a few others. Uh, and then I met a guy called Johann Heine at a lecture in Pretoria in 2007, um, about a year after releasing the book or so. And uh, Johann um, said to me, would you like to see some interesting ancient ruins in South Africa? So I said, of course. Um, so he whipped out his laptop and he started showing me these aerial photographs of these stone circles, these circular stone structures. And I'd never seen that before. And it just blew my mind. And it was like an immediate connection, immediate psychic, genetic, some connection that I had to those, to those ruins and those photographs. And I knew instantly that these ruins are directly connected to the, the central theme in my book, Slave Species of God. Um, and it's uh, and uh, so one thing led to another. 
a few months went by and I then met up with Johan Heiner later that year, 2007, and he showed me from a helicopter all these ruins uh, scattered around, mostly in Pumalanga, where we flew around. And that just blew my mind. I could not believe what I saw. Uh, it is literally jaw-dropping, astonishing, mind-numbing, unbelievable when you see it for the first time. Mountains and valleys covered in these circular stone structures and ruins, all connected to each other. Uh, it, it, you, your mind starts to wonder what the hell's going on and how come nobody knows about it? So that literally led to me moving to Mpumalanga uh, within a few months. And, um, and I've been here ever since, uh, researching the ruins, making, I guess, uh, groundbreaking and historic discoveries, uh, which includes Adam's calendar that was discovered or rediscovered by Johann Heine. He shared that discovery with me. And that just um, one thing led to another. And before I knew, I was publishing books and doing lectures around the world about these ancient ruins that I realized were rediscovering a vanished civilization at the southern tip of Africa, and not just a vanished civilization. The largest concentration of ancient ruins found anywhere on Earth, and we are sitting right on top of them, right here under our feet in South Africa, and very few South Africans are even aware of it. Like in the ancient times when these mysterious structures were constructed, it went pretty much from, it's like a 500 kilometer belt from from uh, very close to Mozambique or even into Mozambique, um, all the way to the other side of Rustenburg and Zierist and uh, into Botswana. And, uh, and, uh, and there's this belt that goes north right through Zimbabwe and across Zimbabwe into Zambia as well. And there are just thousands and thousands, in fact, millions of these stone ruins. So my discovery was that we're dealing with probably 10 million or more, 10 million or more of these stone structures. And then I started to discover the, the, the strange tools, the cone-shaped tools, the, the donut stones or the torus stones uh, that turned out to be the most advanced technology in all of not only history, but, but current technology that, uh, that all the most recent, all the most advanced um, research in military and technology all centers around toroidal fields and these, these, these donut-shaped stones or torus stones our source of that energy. Uh, Cone-shaped tools and then um, coincidentally many of the stone circle ruins also happen to be in the shape of magnetrons, these giant, giant flower-shaped structures that then very clearly, uh, it became very clear that these are not just accidental flower shape, that they were specifically built like that in the shape of giant magnetrons. And for those that understand electronics and ele electricity and electrical engineering will understand that magnetrons are used to generate huge amounts of power. Every microwave's got a, ma a little magnetron in it, about this size. Uh, magnetrons are used in, in advanced military complex for weapons and so forth. So we're dealing with a, an unbelievable discovery that was lying right under our feet and no one was put, no one was connecting the dots. No one understood the, the separate pieces of the puzzle, I guess, until I came along. And because of my background in music and sound resonance frequency, understanding cymatics, which is critical in this. If you don't understand cymatics or the, the study of sound and how sound manifests into physical form and how sound is the source of all of creation, uh, if you don't have a background in that, you'll never be able to put this together. And unfortunately, our academic institutions draw very hard boundaries between departments and between faculties. And unfortunately, we churn out um, very brilliant young minds, but we, we churn them out with blinkers on uh, and we restrict their capacity to think outside the box. And uh, that's unfortunately what the situation is right now. So um, in a nutshell, that's that's my life. It's my discovery. And during that process, I um, also discovered the origins of money, the true origins of money uh, that goes back to the to the Sumerian times when the first priest kings appeared on earth out of the blue and they started to build their temples that became the banks from where they dispensed laws and punishment. And they also started to um, to issue the first forms of money in the form of clay tablets. And in return for people bringing in their gold and silver, they, they would give the people clay tablets with some writing on it. So you give me your gold, I'll give you a piece of clay. 
clearly that is not a fair trade, not a fair exchange. And I realized that that original scam of the these first mysterious priest kings that lived for thousands of years that had mysterious weapons with which they could smite people and kill vast numbers of people on you know very very quickly uh, and that's why they became the or that's how they ruled because people were fearful of them they feared them and um for very good reasons and um and so I realized that the scam that the banking industry is today that works with bills of exchange and promissory notes started all the way back 6,000 years ago with those first priest kings that mysteriously appeared on earth and became the first royal bloodline. That's the foundation and the roots of the royal bloodlines that we still find in the world today. And um, and that led to the to the Ubuntu movement and the 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 philosophy and the idea of the one small town initiative which is now spreading around the world like like a wildfire and that's pretty much what i'm busy with you know 12 to 16 hours a day right now now that's incredible that's um all sounds amazing i, I think i think the first question i have is i was also shocked when i found out about this the these ruins of this ancient civilization and i think the first question i have is why do you think so few South Africans know about it. Why? Why does nobody talk about it? Well, the, we have to uh, lay the the blame squarely at the feet of of academia, of our universities. Absolutely. Even today, even today, after all the scientific fourteen years of scientific evidence I've presented in many videos, in many papers, um, they still deny it. They refute it. And they still argue uh, that the stone circles are built by people as dwellings. It is spectacular. The, their blindness, their, their toxicity, their toxic approach towards accepting something new is virtually impenetrable. It's as if they are being given some sort of instructions from a higher, higher level to say, you will not go down that road. You will not acknowledge these. You will ignore it. Just keep denying, deny, 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 because we cannot open that can of worms. Because the moment you go down that road, you have to start thinking outside of the box. You have to start asking hard questions that, that academia, unfortunately, has not been able to answer for decades and decades, um, if not hundreds of years. So, you know, I don't know why South Africans don't know about it. The media uh, is to blame for, for, obviously, because if the media jumped on this and the media wrote about this and the media made videos about it, everybody would know about it. They make videos about the pyramids and about Machu Picchu and Stonehenge. Here we have far more impressive and much older ruins on a much larger scale in South Africa. And the media is doing nothing, nothing about it. They're not writing about it. And the problem here is that the, the media keeps going for answers to the academics. And the academics keep telling them, oh, there's nothing to see there. Don't worry about it. There's nothing to see. It's, uh, it, it has no real significance. It has no real value. And therefore, the media ignores it because they believe the academics. So there's this toxic, cyclical, um, you know, runaround, mm -hmm. and uh, and then they come to me, and then they ask me for what I think, and I tell them, well, I don't think so, I know so, and I show them the museum, I show them the evidence, I show them the fossils, fossils of giants and creatures and reptilians, and 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 I mean giants, you know, we have fingers of giants and teeth of giants and and all kinds of other extinct creatures. Um, and and then they they go crazy. They go, wow, this is amazing. Then they run off. Then the media runs off to the academics, and they say, oh, what do you think of Michael Tellinger's museum and blah 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 and all this these theories that that this is you know what he says. And they go, oh, it's all nonsense. It's all rubbish. Michael Tellinger is an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And that's what they publish. So it, they, it, they it are sounds like media. you. It, it sounds like you go through something very similar to Graham Hancock because I mean he, oh. he's faced the exact same thing. Yeah, no, it's it is a global uh, look. It's the same way that the global elite are restricting knowledge, restri restricting information, shutting down new technology, energy technology, and medical technology, getting rid of of any new inventions and and anything that could help humanity. It's immediately shut down, removed. You know, the inventors are threatened or paid off or simply killed, and uh, and none of that technology ever makes it into the mainstream. Um, th wow. The same thing is happening with academia with regarding ancient civilizations. They have to constantly deny and hide 
how incredibly advanced the the civilizations here in South Africa were 300,000 years ago. We're not talking about a few thousand years. We're talking hundreds of thousands of years. It could be more than that. It could be a million years. Uh, we on, don't know. On that, on that note, um, I actually wanted to ask you about that. So w what evidence have you found that suggests it's so old, 300,000 years old? Well, first of all, the erosion on the stones, the erosion on some of the rocks is just spectacular. You don't get that kind of erosion in a few thousand years. Mm. The patina growth, the patina on some of the artifacts that you know used to be hold and the artifact breaks and then the patina grows on it. When you study the patina, you know this is not just you know a few thousand years old. This is dozens, if not hundreds of thousands of years old. But the most compelling one, uh, and that's the most recent discovery I've made, uh, and that's um, when I realized that the rivers that have formed in the mountains around the stone circles um, in the, that run down in, in the valleys, the rivers have washed away stone circles, the walls, the terraces, and the channels that connect them together, which means the stone circles were already there when the rivers had formed. I see. So the rivers are younger than the stone circles. That's fascinating. That's uh, and yeah, I think I think it's a massive crime that I mean people don't know about this. I mean, even if, as you say, they they suggested some sort of very basic development, it's still very strange that we aren't told about it in school. I mean, I've I've done two videos on your work so far. Uh, the one got three hundred thousand views, and almost no one in in the comments knew what what this the structure was and if you go online there's very little information about it as well you you were describing how how many circles there are uh, in this region i had no idea it, it, it's um, it, it's disappointing how, how little information there is online but you said it spans a couple of hundred kilometers all these circles it runs uh, it runs all the way from south africa from from KZN um, across the Free State, as I said, about 500 kilometers, because it also includes Joburg, Pretoria, the whole of the, you know, all of them from Langa into Gauteng and then into Northwest, um, Rustenburg. There's some huge, huge um, clusters of ruins in uh, just around Rustenburg and all the way beyond Rustenburg, right? To, towards Botswana border and and slightly into Botswana as well, and so that wide band uh, stretches from you know the, the southern KZN and, and Free State all the way north throughout what would have been the Transvaal across into Zimbabwe from the east all the way to the eastern border into Mozambique right to the other side to Bulawayo um, wow. where the Kami where the Kami ruins are in Bulawayo and north and it goes all the way north and it crosses uh, the Zambezi into Z into Zambia. So it's a huge area. So do you, do you think this was one large city or, or oh, what absolutely. exactly? Absolutely. We, we know it's one large city because the, 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 the common structures, the, the way they were built, the artifacts that are found among the, the ruins, uh, and also the, the Sumerian texts. The Sumerian texts very clearly tell us about the huge gold mining activities in what they refer to as the Abzu, which which was Southern Africa, and it, they even uh, defined it into the Abzu and the Deep Abzu. So I believe that the Abzu may have been Zimbabwe, and the Deep Abzu it was even further south, which is probably referring to South Africa today. Uh, and Adam's oh. calendar is is clearly connected to Great Zimbabwe, and is clearly connected to the Great Pyramid of Giza because they're all mm. aligned on the same 31 degrees east line. That doesn't happen by accident. This is all done by intent. So. And what do those three cultures all have in common? Gold mining civilizations. Yes. Egypt was a gold mining civilization. It's all about the gold. Great Zimbabwe is a gold mining civilization. It was the mecca of gold for hundreds of years. That's where the that's where the ancient times, the, the Phoenicians would get their gold from Great Zimbabwe. <laughs> so basically, Great Zimbabwe and Adam's calendar was connected. It was the same place. Yes. That's that's yeah. crazy. It's. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier that you found very interesting technology there. Uh, correct me if my understanding is wrong, but 
basically this was technology that could somehow manipulate sound waves to basically move objects and so on. Is that correct? Yeah, well, that is the fundamental the fundamental source of everything in creation is sound, resonance, and vibration. Mm. And that's what the Bible says, God said, let there be light. Mm. It's the sound of creation, the sound of God that creates light, which is an electromagnetic field. And the combination of magnetic field, which is sound, sound is a magnetic field, and light, which is an electromagnetic field. So now you've got sound and electromagnetic field, and, um, and you've got the formation of physical matter. Just recently, just a few weeks ago, the, the Max Planck Institute in, I think they're in Switzerland or Austria, forget where they are now, um, but they just published a big paper. For the first time, they've now really given the game away, which many of us have known for you know decades that sound manifests physical form. It's that mm. simple. And yeah, if I've, people did, yeah. I've okay. heard um, people speculate that that's how the Egyptians built the pyramids and whatnot was through this technology. So yes. it's very fascinating that you've you've found evidence of it being in in this civilization as well. So th these circles, uh, these hundreds or thousands of circles around millions, m millions, 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 of millions of circles around Southern Af Africa. What exactly? were they used for or, or is it is is it uh, remains of circular structures or what exactly is it? So every stone circle is completely unique. There are no two stone circles that are that are ident oh. that are the same. It's okay. simply impossible. Because all the stone circles were built through using sound, using vibrational frequency of the earth and identifying the shape of the sound at that specific place. It's called the cymatic pattern. If you put sand on a metal plate, you put a sound frequency through it, the sand will create a very unique shape. That's called a cymatic pattern. The shape of that frequency, of that specific frequency. Now you got it in physical form. In 2D, but at least you can see what it looks like. So where the, where the sand on the metal plate shows you that shape of that sound frequency, um, and I'd recommend uh, go to... Um, John Stuart Green is the world authority on cymatics and sound. John Stuart Green, um, uh, John Stuart Reed, sorry, John Stuart Reed, um, and um, and also I recommend go and look, go find Hans Jenny's uh, documentary. It's on YouTube called Cymatics, um, the, how, uh, the, all about sound. Uh, everybody should be taught this in the first few years of school, because mm. it changes your perception of, of physics and science and the reality and the world around us. It completely and utterly reshapes your thinking. If mm. we know that from an early age, we will, we will look at the world around us completely differently. So uh, what we now know is that the stone circles are actually just si the cymatic representations of the sound frequency coming out of the earth at that specific place. It is not a, a built as a dwelling for people or cows, okay, as our academics keep. They still, they yes. are still insisting that that's what it is. It is mind numbing how dumb these people are, <laughs> how arrogant, how stubborn, and how dumb they are. Because yeah. their stupidity is just going to come back to bite them and show how stupid and how arrogant and and how how stubborn they were when they were faced with with the facts right in front of them. Mm. Because you know it's it's very clearly spelled out in 1931 already, uh, when Bloemfontein University and and uh, and and whatever and the museum Bloemfontein Museum did a study here at, at Blobosch Kral, and the, the ruins around it, where they very categorically say that the original structures have no doors and entrances, and we have found thousands of stone ruins, the original stone circles with no doors and entrances. So if you find a structure with no doors and entrances, you have to instantly um, remove or eliminate the possibility that this was a dwelling for people or cows. There are many that have been converted with doors and entrances, but mm. those were the recent, the, the more recent civilizations that arrived. They found all these structures. They were, wow, this is fantastic. We'll set up camp here. Of course they're going to set up camp here because they, all the foundations and the walls and the buildings have been built for them. Yes. So they just renovated it for their needs and they stayed there for as long as they needed to stay there. And there are many ruins that I've been taking tourists to and, and um, doing research in uh, in this area that show different levels 
within one ruin you can see the ancient part of the ruin you can see the the one from you know 400 years ago or so or 300 years ago then you see another uh, group of people arriving and uh, they are more square buildings inside it that they erected square walls with doors and square windows and you and you see the different types of settlers that came and settled and used these ruins it's like fingerprints of the occupants right over so, so, the last so basic basically this this uh, advanced civilization was there something happened to it and then over time people came built on top of whatever uh, was was still there yes. and they eventually went off and then there was another group that came is, is that correct something like that okay. something like that it seems like there was definitely a, some sort of a giant uh, cataclysm or like a flood or something because there's that wiped everything out mm. because there's definitely evidence from some of the aerial photographs you can see that there's evidence of water moving through some of these ruins mm. and not only that the fact that we're picking up mud fossils mud fossils fossilized body parts bones pieces of meat with with bite marks and claw marks in them that have turned to stone that we that I've picked up collected thousands of them from the mountains around us in the mud suggests that there was some sort of a flood and a movement of water and everything was covered in mud uh, yeah. and then you know thousands of years of rain it washes the mud away and um, and it exposes the ruins on tops of the mountains and this is why the ruins on the tops of the mountains are more visible than the ones down the sides or mm -hmm. in the bottom of the valleys the ones in the valleys would have been covered by the sliding soil and sand and sometimes you don't even see them until you start digging and uh, sometimes you do, so we know they are there. And uh, and sometimes you see them just in the late afternoon. You can see this huge, big open field. And when you wait for the sun just to hit the right angle, you can see all the inundations, the undulations, you can see it mm. covers a huge, vast field of ruins. <laughs> wow. So, so Adam's calendar is obviously part of these ruins. So what exactly sets Adam's calendar apart from the, the rest of it? Well, it's directly connected to it, you're quite right. But Adam's calendar is, is, a, is I would say, the flagship among these ruins. And okay. it, was a, it was a giant machine, a very powerful machine. I refer to it as a, you know, as a Stargate or a, a Beam Me Up Scotty device. That's what I suspect it was. You know, some people might laugh at it, but that's okay. God bless you. If you don't have so, enough information, you'll laugh at stuff like that. But when you have enough information, you're going to be fascinated by stuff like that when you realize how little we actually know. So it was, you know, uh, it's difficult to know 100% exactly what it was used for, but uh, perhaps yeah, it's, it, it is. You're quite right. Okay. It, we, are, we are speculating, but they're very, they're very strong indicators that suggest what it probably was. So it's on the edge of a of the mountain there in near Carpsohoop overlooking the Barberton Valley, which is filled with yellow sand, mm. um, which, which we have the pyramids in the, at the center of it that are aligned with the, with the, rise, the rise of Orion. Um, we know that, um, that Adam's calendar was built by the Sumerian entity Enki, who is the supreme commander of the, of the, of the Anunnaki. Um, the Anunnaki that, that, that are well defined in the, or the Anunna gods as they refer to in the Sumerian texts. Uh, other, then they became known as the Anunnaki through the works like Zachariah Sitchin and others, other authors. Uh, but the Anunna were these very advanced beings with the powerful weapons. And, you know, I, I suspect that those first priest kings were some of the Anunnaki with the powerful weapons that became the priest kings. They were much larger than humans. And, uh, and um, you know, the Bible talks about them as well, when the sons yes. of the gods or the daughters of man. Nephilim. And, or... Exactly, the Nephilim. So there's, there's possibly a connection between the Anunna, Anunna gods and the Anunnaki and the Nephilim. And these guys were obsessed with gold. They were mining gold on a scale that we cannot possibly imagine. Um, so plus on the other side of, of Adam's calendar of the Barberton crater, you've got Barberton, and you got Chiba gold mine, and you got a bunch of other gold mines that are still there today. And uh, I suspect they just rediscovered ancient gold mines that were there a long time ago and started mining it. And Adam's calendar itself sits right on top of a gold mine wow. that was closed That was closed in 1930, I think, or around there, the late 20s, 1920s, or early 1930s. And that was the gold mine that started the gold rush at Carp Suhup and Pumalanga. There was a gold nugget found there, and that started the gold rush. And Adam's calendar is right there. 
I believe that Enki, Sumerian entity, built what what we call Adam's calendar. Um, it's it's a, it's a very powerful machine, literally like a beam me up, Scotty. It's a toroidal energy generating device that that creates um, that uses sound to create stargates. Um, I, I thought I thought it was called Adam's calendar because it was something to do with timekeeping. Or was no, that just no, a no, no, I gave it the name Adam's calendar when when I was introduced to it, because okay. I immediately knew that it was somehow connected to the origins of humankind. So, so who is the first human was Adam. So it's sense. a calendar. It keeps time. But that is not the main reason. The 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 calendar aspect is just a, a built in feature into a much more powerful machine that wow. it used to be. That's fascinating. So the Anunnaki who you say built this, uh, what's your opinion of who do you think they are? Do you, do you think it's extraterrestrials or, or what's your yeah, opinion? Of course, of course they're extraterrestrials. It's very clearly spelled out. The Sumerian texts, the, look, this th th hundreds of thousands of Sumerian texts and the central theme of all the Sumerian texts are the Anuna gods, are the Anunnaki. So it's not yes. like, oh, it was found in one clay tablet somewhere hidden and there's a cryptic clue about these beings. It is, it is written in such ridiculous detail that anyone who tries to ignore this it should just literally just you know from an academic perspective should just go into a different profession just go mm. fishing because this is clearly not your calling you, uh, yeah you, uh, we we mentioned it earlier it's very disappointing how these things are dismissed and uh you know at the very least people should be exposed to it so they can make up their their own conclusions at least at the very least um but so Obviously, uh, this Anunnaki also would have built the the Great Pyramids and well, at this all these at this structures. stage, yeah, at this stage, Austin, it seems like it's quite possible. Mm. I'm not saying they did, but there are strong indicators that suggest they they may have been the architects of the pyramids. Mm. And um, you know, uh, in in Zachariah Sitchin's work, for example, he talks about the pyramids and talks about the pyramid wars when Anunnaki was started to fight amongst each other. Um, you know, they were they were not necessarily a, a good benevolent group. Um, they certainly didn't use money. They they didn't use money, but I think they they may have created money. And this was another group of beings that created the idea of money mm. uh, as a tool of enslavement over humanity. Mm. Um, that's what money is. That's what, how, what money it was created for, was purely as a tool of enslavement over humanity. And look how well it's oh. worked. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, is it true that the, that um, I believe I read somewhere that Adam's calendar it, it, it uh, points in the exact same direction uh, as, as the pyramids, as something along those lines? Is, is that true? Well, well, at the it, it's it's on the thirty one degrees east longitudinal line, okay, uh, which so is not directly, a coincidence. So, so it's yeah. Adam's calendar, the Great Zimbabwe, and the Great Pyramid, on the same line. There's a subtle shift, but they're they're in line. Wow. The one is just the one is just on the other side of thirty one. The one is sort of on thirty one, and Adam's calendar is just this side of thirty one. So, they they they're in line. But at Adam's calendar, there are two distinct pyramids in the valley. And um, and when you draw a golden spiral, golden means spiral, which is the sacred geometry of creation, uh, it it lands from Adam's calendar. It lands right between the two pyramids in the valley. So there's a connection. You can't deny that. If you deny that, then you clearly have no idea what's going on in the world. You have no idea how the world is held together by magnetic forces, how the universe, the universe yeah. is held together by magnetism, by magnetic fields. It's a fundamental force of the universe. And here we have a, a, a golden spiral that represents magnetic fields. Some people, sometimes they're also referred to as ley lines on Earth. Um, those are just uh, ignorant expressions by Mr. Ley for the magnetic fields that, that make up the entire planet, the surface mm. of the planet and, and the air around us, the atmosphere, all connected through the toroidal magnetic field that holds the Earth together, the world together. And... Um, and uh, so you can't deny that the that the pyramids are connected to Adam's calendar simply for that simple fact that the golden mean spiral from Adam's calendar lands right between the pyramids. That's not a coincidence. It could have landed. That, that's anywhere. very strange. You know, that makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's now, now. Some people have referred also to Adam's calendar. Uh, I don't know if you've referred to it as this. I couldn't find anywhere 
you refer you link in Stonehenge to Adam's calendar, but is there any kind of link there that you found? I, I have certainly not linked Stonehenge to Adam's calendar, Thought but so. uh, but we do have you know Baba Credo Mutwa, who is no longer with us, yes. the famous Zulu shaman, yes. who I had the pleasure of meeting several times and spent you know, probably two full days with him. Um, he told me very clearly that Adam's calendar is what what the shamans refer to in Southern Africa as Enzalo Yilanga, which means birthplace of the sun, mm. where humanity was created by the gods to be the slaves in the gold mines for the gods. So mm. this is what the African shaman's telling us, and Kreda Mutwa is the flag bearer for that. Yes. And, um, you know, you got to listen to that and pay attention to that. Unfortunately, the Western academics um, that are filled with Western thinking uh, and Euro Eurocentric thinking, uh, they just dismissed that, uh, and it is it is a great tragedy. Yeah, I've I've uh, heard about him as well. He, he, it's very fascinating uh, what what he said. Could you tell us is is there any kind of folklore in South African folklore uh, about strange beings, uh, anything along those lines? Well, uh, Kreda Mutwa writes about it in great detail in in his book, uh, his most famous book called Indaba, My Children. Okay. He talks about the, the lizard people. He talks about the Anunnaki. He talks mm. about the, the gray aliens. He talks about all these different beings and creatures that that have been here, that are here, and, and we're just not aware of it. Wow. And what they're doing to humanity and, and, and so forth. You know, some people might find this too wild to, to, to believe. That's all right. Mm. Have a nice life. God bless you. You know, enjoy the fairy tale, and um, sooner or later, you know, you might wake up and realize that mythology is not a crazy story that we are told by historians. Mythology, mm -hmm. at this stage, unquestionably, is the true history of the of the world. We've got to take everything we get taught in mainstream history classes and throw that out. Obviously, there are some things that are, you know, yes, the Dutch arrived in the Cape, and yes, the America. The, you know, uh, the guys went, the, what's his name from Spain, went to America and so forth. Yes, okay, there are uh, these events, oh, yes, but, yes. but all the stuff in between, what happened before that and what happened in between, that's all fuzzy and fudged and changed to fit the narrative of the Eurocentric historians that write the history books. They change everything. It seems that they write, the more you study this, Austin, the more you realize that it is very, very, very likely that they keep rewriting our history every every few hundred years. Mm. And you'd think that it's impossible. No. If you sit and actually think what they'd have to do to do that, you realize how simple it actually is. Especially uh, in the older days when everything was written records, that's, I suppose, very easy to get rid of. Uh, well, the Library of Alexandria was a great example. You know, they didn't want that information to be uh, available. That's why they burnt it down. Mm. <laughs> And there's a lot of African um, history that's been lost as well. Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately. Absolutely. And and mythology, look, when you start realizing that the history of this world is not what we've been told, is not this lovely lily white fairy tale with lots of wars and conflict by Vikings and all this and there, and they're like, no, 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 it's a... Uh, you know, why do all ancient cultures talk about dragons? Why do all ancient cultures and the Bible and other texts talk about giants? No matter where you look in ancient times, they all talk about dragons and giants and other creatures that we don't even, you know, can't even pronounce some of them. And, and yes. these are not just giants. They're different sizes of giants. And again, I can verify that because in my museum, I have fossilized body parts of giants that are about... 80 to 100 meters tall. On the topic of, of giants, and that, that's amazing, and I would love to see that. That's incredible. So uh, I also uh, I've heard that there's a there's a footprint in Pumalanga as well on on a rock, uh, which yeah. I believe you've looked into as well. Um, I'm assuming you uh, you believe that's 100 percent authentic because I've naturally I've seen a lot of criticism about, but I want to hear directly from you your thoughts on that. Of course, it's a footprint. You know, if it, it quacks like, like a duck, look, walks, walks like a duck, shits like a duck, it's a duck. Yeah. You know, again, stop making up bullshit stories about something that you, because your own belief system can't allow you to believe that, that there were giants, mm. you have to dismiss it. And it's just, this is the great tragedy, uh, tragedy of our time that 
ignorant and dumb people are left in positions of power and make and decision making. Uh, and, and and sometimes that's really, really dangerous. In fact, mm. most of the times it's very, very dangerous. In fact, all of the time it's very, very dangerous when you leave those kind of people in decisions of power, yes. uh, but, you know, uh, where they can make uh, decisions that influence our lives. And that is telling us what is wrong, what is right and what is wrong in history. Really? Here's a footprint. It's obviously a footprint. So you're going to tell me this is natural erosion? No, your brain is a natural mm. erosion. Go away. <laughs> Stop telling the people what to believe because you're an idiot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've just we got to stop pulling punches and start treating these academics with a kind of disregard and disrespect that they treat everybody else. Mm. No, that's uh, I also I've seen the pictures. And I mean, to me, it looks exactly like a footprint. It, seem, it would seem like a very strange coincidence if somehow that was that was erosion. But have there been any other big discoveries in South Africa, maybe related to ancient structures, apart from the ones you've already told me? Um, well, the structures is a tough one. I think the stone circles and Adam's calendar are probably the biggest discovery, mm. unquestionably. Then you have the tools, the, mm. the, the donut-shaped stones and the cone-shaped tools, obviously. And then the fossils, the, the fossilized body parts that, that are everywhere. I just, I, I'm the, I was the one that suddenly found out and discovered that these are these are not just stones that, that have weird shapes. These are the reason they have weird shapes is because they're not stones, because they are fossilized body parts. And the moment you, your brain accepts that, then suddenly you look around and you go, "Oh my God, I'm looking at a field of." leftovers of creatures that have turned to stone mm. and the mountains are covered in them. You cannot appreciate that until you come on a tour and we go up the mountains. And I say in many of my videos, the mountains of Mpumalanga and, and many parts of South Africa are covered in the fossilized body parts of creatures, uh, humanoids, reptilians and giants. And uh, people don't realize that I'm serious when I say that, until I take them on a tour. And as we drive, I point out the fossils everywhere. And then we stop, we go look at them. And you can just see the people's mind and their pers perspective shift. Mm. It is a very interesting thing to see happen. And I've been doing this for nearly 15 years now. So I've seen the evolution of this and, um, and how the, the skeptics come into the museum. And when they leave, their their mind has been shattered because their belief system have has been ripped apart, and now they have to come to terms and digest what they just witnessed, mm. and and many people struggle with that. Some people love it. It's like actually most of the people that come to the museum, my museum here, that they love it and they come there for the reason because they want to see it, and then some of them come along and they just they really struggle to deal with this. You know, I, I think everyone has an inbuilt curiosity, uh, wanting to know more. So. You say Mpumalanga is like a hotspot of, of these fossils, and I'm assuming it's more so in South Africa because, as you've said, it was, a, it was a mining hotspot. So it's obviously not like this everywhere. And Zimbabwe as well, South Africa and Zimbabwe. Yes. Sorry, it's, it's, it Southern is, Africa. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is just insane. If you know what you're looking for, you'll find evidence of stone circles pretty much everywhere you go in that band that I've mentioned. Mm. Um, and, and you'll find remains of stone circles, you'll find fossilized body parts, if you know what you're looking for and well, how, how, to, how, to, how to identify. You'll also notice if you look at mountains uh, where there are stone circles covered by soil, just by looking at the way the soil lies, you'll also notice where there would have been um, some gold mining activity. There's a lot of yellow sand in, in specific places that shouldn't be there. And just like we have the mine dumps around Joburg, you know, and, and, and our cities, um, there's mine dumps, yellow sand everywhere. And if you were suddenly brought into Joburg and, you, and it was deserted and you had no idea what these yellow sand dumps were, what would you think it was? You had no reference that these were remains of, ancient, of gold mines, ancient mm. gold mines from, you know, 130 years ago, 150 years ago. These were gold mines from 150 years ago. Wow, ancient gold mines. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think that. Mm. Well, there's piles of yellow sand. Where they come from? It's it, it, the amount of um, evidence that backs up 
uh, everything is is crazy. And I really hope South Africans can learn more about this. Uh, and that leads me to the next point of conversation. You you mentioned earlier that the, the project you're working on, uh, One Small Town, links to what you've told me in, ma in many ways. Uh, could you tell us a little bit how and why and, and what exactly uh, the project entails? Well, first of all, um, anyone that is uh, sick and tired of the world and what's going on in the world, the slavery, the economic slavery, that we have to work like slaves to survive <laughs> and do it a day in, day out, week in, week out, month after month, year after year, uh, where does that end? You know, Surely this is not what we are born for, to work for Anglo-American for pick and pay or, or to clean toilets. So, like This is not what we as human beings were born for. This is not what we meant to do. Mm. So there are millions and millions of people disgruntled with what's going on in the world and they're not happy with their lives. So I recommend go to uh, onesmalltown.org and, and read our website. Read the onesmalltown.org website. Realize what we're doing around the world. This is an initiative that started in 2005. So it's been around a long time. I have developed this from a, a simple crazy idea when I discovered that money the origins of money goes all the way back to those early priest kings that mysteriously appeared out of nowhere, started to rule the world. They started to issue um, the first forms of money in, as a form of clay tablet in return for, for people for, that brought in gold into their temples. And you know, then the temples became the banks and the courtrooms. And you see the connection between the legal structure and the financial structure and royalty. So there's your holy trinity, right, of the global control today. And, uh, and I realized, oh, my God, the, the money was created not to help people. Money was created absolutely as in the highest level of, of, uh, of control. So it's a, it's a control mechanism over humanity. And, uh, and we still use it today. The Rothschilds mm -hmm. in the 1760s, when they started the modern banking industry, modern banking system, and literally captured the world with their central banks, they perfected that ancient um, that ancient issuing of promissory notes. And that's what the banking industry is today. So I started to think, well, what would happen if you took money out of the system? And boy, did that lead me down an exciting journey. Because the more I thought about, if I woke up tomorrow morning and money didn't exist, what would happen? And at first you're horrified and you think, wow, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? And then you start thinking practically about it. And you go, okay, of course, we don't need money to build a bridge. We just need guys that know how to build a bridge. And we need the stone. So we need stone masons. And for that, we don't need money. And then very quickly, I realized, oh, my goodness. Yeah, actually, money does nothing. People do everything. We do everything. So mm -hmm. we don't need money. We need each other. So, so I realized that, um, that when you remove money from the system, things become a lot easier. It's going to take a little while for people to realize that we just have to cooperate and collaborate and work together and we can achieve anything. We don't mm. need money to do that. And so you, I, I realize that money is just a, a hurdle to progress. And we allow bankers and central banks to tell us what we can and cannot do. Mm. If you think about it, you know, you've, you're passionate about starting a school, a music school, and you go to the bank and say, look, I need a million rand or I start a music school. And the banker will tell you, I'm sorry, your, your, your idea is not financially viable. You go, Excuse me? Well, I yeah. want to start a bakery to bake bread to feed our, feed our village. And the bankers will say, sorry, your idea is not financially viable. Mm. So we don't look at what humanity needs, what we want and what we need. We allow bankers and the money system to tell us what we can and cannot do. Surely that is utterly and completely wrong. And slowly but surely, I started to evolve this idea of creating a world without money, where money doesn't exist. And people cooperate and collaborate to, for the highest good of everyone in the community. And that led to the Ubuntu movement um, yes. you know, that, that, um, that then was born out of that. And, um, and uh, because the, the African philosophy of Ubuntu is really exactly that. People work together for the greater good of the community. So and, it's basically uh, a way to overhaul the whole economic system and to yes. reinvent a new one. 
Yeah, to create a new one. And and so over many years, uh, after going into politics, creating the Ubuntu party, you know, running in three elections, realizing that politics is not the way to go, that it's not possible to inject a seed of consciousness into the political beast because the political beast is rotten to the core from within and controlled by very powerful outside forces, the large corporations, the global elite, and most importantly, the bankers and the central banks that run and control our governments just like the South African Reserve Bank. And just if any of your viewers don't know this, the central banks do not belong to the people. They do not belong to our government. They do not belong to anyone. They belong to the Rothschild Global Banking Empire. They are, a, they are an entity and a law unto itself. They operate outside of the jurisdiction of each country. They are not controlled by the laws of our countries. You cannot sue the Reserve Bank. You cannot sue the Fed. You cannot audit them. They are a law unto themselves. They have their own private armies and their own private security. And they're all controlled from the Basel, Switzerland, what is known as the, the Bank for International Settlements. But this is a whole other discussion. But this is just a quick uh, crash course for people that think that central banks belong to our country. No, they lend money to our country, our governments and our banks. And that's why we have constant debt, because we are borrowing money from an independent company which is owned by the Rothschilds, the global Rothschild banking empire. It's a, it's a ridiculous situation. And millions of people know about this, but they don't know what to do about it, how to get out of it. So out of this, um, this you know, nearly 17 year long journey that I went on, uh, sharing information and starting to travel around the world, doing lectures on, on the ancient civilizations and origins of humankind, and then also talking about a new way going forward because we can't continue the way we are. And I started to bring in the, the Ubuntu philosophy and that eventually came became the One Small Town initiative uh, when I said, all we need is, is, is one town to start cooperating and collaborating and growing food for ourselves on a large scale. So we got more than enough food for ourselves and we can export the food and then we can build computers. If we know how to do this, we can make bicycles or fridges or, or make all the different foods down the value chain. We don't need uh, to buy Rice Krispies and, and, um, and Corn Flakes from Kellogg's. We can make them ourselves, right? And, um, and so forth. And you realize that, wow, if we just do this and we start to create a cohesive community uh, where people work together for the greater benefit of everyone, that means we'll have abundance and prosperity beyond our wildest imagination. And that slowly but surely evolved into the One Small Town Initiative. Uh, and um, from 2016, in, tw in 2016, we ran with the Ubuntu Party uh, in 13 municipalities only, the local elections, to try and win just one municipality so we can implement the One Small Town Initiative there. Well, we learned again after 2014 that the elections are crooked, they cheat, they, the, the results are not representative of what the people voted for. That became very clear to us. And I realized that we have to get away from politics to, to promote the One Small Town philosophy. And so since then it's been promoted as the One Small Town Initiative. And, um, and it's just evolved and evolved over the years. And then um, our first few towns uh, manifested in April, 2022. Just more, just uh, almost a year ago, it's when we started to implement the first towns, the one in South Africa, in Kuruman, and a small town in Lebanon, Ras El Matin. Since then, um, we have about 28 towns in Lebanon um, that are coming on board. In South Africa, as of today, I think we got more than 20 towns that are coming on board. And um, we have uh, towns, we have ambassadors in 16 countries. I think we have about 20 ambassadors now for one small town around the world. And uh, it's just growing like crazy because people are realizing that the One Small Town Initiative is at this stage the only solution for the economic slavery problem we all face. And if we just start working together, we can get out of it quite quickly. No, that's amazing. And uh, how how are the towns doing? Is Does it seem to be working well? Well, it's brand new. You know, it's literally, okay. it's brand new. So it's a huge baptism by fire. Mm. This is a theory that's been developed, and now we're putting it into practice. So we're learning as we go. But what has happened now is we we realize that we can't manage this, you know, with Excel spreadsheets and that. So we are fortunate enough to find uh, two guys here in, in Gauteng that offered us um, 
offered us their um, offered us their services. Uh, and uh, sorry, I, I better just uh, put this on on. Um, no, no problem. We won't they be offered us they, they offered us their services in building an IT platform and a blockchain for us, and that has changed everything. Mm. So um, that also then uh, led us to create our own community token, like a cryptocurrency token, the Infinity token, which is issued to every One Small Town member um, uh, when you contribute your three hours uh, to the One Small Town initiative in your community. So it's very simple. Uh, mm. We create a cooperative. Uh, everybody is an equal uh, shareholder and equal member of all the businesses that we start. The only thing you have to do is pledge to contribute three hours a week minimum. You can contribute three hours a week or three hours a day if you want, but the minimum you need to contribute is three hours a week. That, just to put it into context, if you have a town of 10,000 people, each contributing just three hours a week, you have 30,000 hours of free labor, our own mm. labor that we're contributing towards our own businesses. Mm. That suddenly makes us a competitor to Mercedes-Benz, to, to any large multinational corporation, because we have 10,000 people. Imagine what the labor bill is of a company that has 10,000 employees. Yeah, we have 10,000 people that are doing this for free. Mm, so exactly. suddenly you realize, oh my God, the power truly lies with the people. Yeah. And it starts to shift your perception. So we are, we are there now and um, we have this incredible blockchain that, that helps to manage and control everything in all the towns that sign up. People sign up as members, they get digital wallets on their account, on their cell phone. And every time they work three hours in their project, they get an infinity token in their digital wallet. And with their digital wallet, they can share those tokens with any other One Small Town member in the world, free of charge, outside of the, the, the banking system, completely um, between them and, and whoever they, they are communicating with. So a very powerful new exchange system of a community token, which I believe will poss possibly may possibly come in handy if the global financial systems collapse. That sounds very fascinating. And and obviously for the viewers, they can find out more on your website, correct? Uh, all of this is on onesmalltown.org, yeah. And uh, you, you'll get updates of all the towns, what we're doing. It's truly staggering uh, mm -hmm. what's happening and how quickly this is growing. No, that's amazing. And um, definitely, and obviously, if people want to get your books, would that be on uh, michaeltellinger.com? Well, it's probably easiest to get my books on Amazon. Okay. Um, it's just it's just very difficult to 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 ship books. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I do my website does ship books in South Africa, but to ship them internationally uh, is is impossible. It's just too expensive. So um, you know, if people are watching this from outside of South Africa, then order it on Amazon. Otherwise, in South Africa, you can order it on on my one of my websites. I think um, it's Stone Circle Tours. Stone Circle Tours actually has the web shop on it that the books are available. Okay, amazing. I'll, I'll definitely want to get uh, those books and and read more. But thank you very much for your time, Michael. It's been uh, an incredible conversation. Um, and yeah, all the best going forward with your project. And yeah, hopefully we can maybe speak again one day. All right, Austin. Thanks for your interest. Uh, all the best with your channel. Thank you and have a great day further.